afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm shocked, number of people here. This is <laughs> pretty amazing. Uh, thanks again for taking time uh, this weekend and coming out and see my presentation. Uh, you may know some of what I'm about to tell you, and uh, I'm hoping not all of it. I uh, hope each and every one of you will will learn a little bit this afternoon. Um, so this painting here is uh, it was done by uh, John Terry of Cedar Knowles, New Jersey. He's a well-known artist. Um, and he allowed Mr. Warren Lee to use that uh, image on the cover of one of his books. Uh, Mr. Lee wrote two volumes on the Bell Dell Railroad, um, which I relied on heavily in developing this particular program. Uh, if you have an interest in learning more, um, those two books are primary sources of information for the railroad. They're very good uh, out of print, but can be found. So my program here today is going to give you an overview of uh, Valley uh, prior to the arrival of the railroad, um, how the railroad imparted some changes to the communities along the route. We'll highlight some significant events um, that occurred along the railroad and hopefully we'll have time to do a short exploration of some of the remaining relics that exist. All right, so before 1930, Hopeful Township was fairly rural in nature. Can I speak louder? <laughs> I'll do my best. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, I'll, I'll do whatever I can. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid not at this time. Uh, this is about as big as it can get. It's, it's what's on my screen. I'm sorry. You can try to pull it back if you'd like. Yes. Is that, that's a little bit better. How's that? Okay. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. All right. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so, uh, before 19 or 1830, pardon me, uh, Hopewell Township was very rural in nature. The uh, vast majority of the residents here were farmers. Uh, there was also some amount of fishing done. And as you can see here on the Delaware River, uh, rafting of logs from upstate New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York to help fuel the markets of uh, Philadelphia, Trenton to some degree. Um, logs were used for just about everything. Um, metalworking was not that common uh, at that particular point. So for construction of buildings, of course, ships, uh, fuel, that was another need for timber. Uh, so in 1802, the number of individuals that were assessed taxes in Hopewell were about seven, uh, pardon me, 517 folks. Uh, so not too many people here. Um, most of them were farmers on uh, land about 200 acres or less. Um, there were 87 houses listed in the township at that time. Uh, we had nine grist mills, six sawmills, one merchant, and a tan yard. Along with that were three ferries, pardon me, three fisheries along the Delaware River and one ferry. Two of those fisheries were located here in Titusville, one on the north end and one apparently on the south end 
of the settlement here. A lot of the raftsmen that brought logs down the Delaware River uh, stayed here uh, in the Titusville Hotel, the Delaware House and the Riverview House, um, which indicated that with an attic floor, it could stable 60 raftsmen, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, rafting uh, stayed in place until probably around the 1890s or so when it really tapered off, uh, exhausted much of the usable timber and upstate. And by that point, most households and industries had converted to the use of coal. But still by 1875, more than 3,000 of these rafts came down the Delaware River. In 1830, the Delaware and Raritan Canal had been chartered by the state. Raising capital for construction was very difficult because most investors were more interested in the Camden and Amboy Railroad. To overcome this in 1831, the legislature acted to combine both the canal company and the railroad company. So this would ensure adequate financial support for the construction of the canal. Canal had been surveyed, in 1830, a route had been established between New Brunswick on the Raritan River, down to Trenton, and then continuing south to Bordentown on the Delaware River. To support the operations on the main canal, a feeder canal had to be constructed to maintain water levels. So this is the canal that runs along the Delaware River, up from Trenton, about 22 and a half miles up to Bulls Island. Construction on the canal commenced in late 1830 and on the feeder in 1831. By 1834, the entire canal was open for traffic. The primary commodities shipped on the canal were coal and pig iron that came from Northern New Jersey. The arrival of the canal here in the Hopo Valley did initiate some growth. There was a development of more residential areas, commercial and, and industrial enterprises, and also allowed the people here to expand their markets for their products that had not been readily accessible at that point. We tend to think that, you know, Farmers didn't do a lot of marketing, but they had to do some because they had taxes to pay and not everybody could barter with whatever product that they had grown. So the roads at that time, you may understand were unimproved, mere paths subject to weather conditions and some upkeep, which probably wasn't all that good at that time. So the canal, opened up an opportunity for farmers to ship their products to other locations, primarily Trenton, New York, and Philadelphia. But it also had the function of bringing people here. With more canal traffic and more boatmen, that's why we had three hotels here in Titusville, because people needed a place to stay. Um, the mules needed to rest and the boatsmen couldn't really travel well at night. So that's how these hotels popped up along the canal. So on the slide that you see in front of you is a, uh, even though it's a little bit later, 1848, uh, and I apologize for its resolution. It was the best I could do. Um, the point is, is that there were many commodities that were transported over the canal. 
Uh, and this gives a list of the, the rates for each one of those commodities. Um, so this brought more items to the town's folk here in Titusville, Washington's Crossing, all along the canal, Lambertville. And uh, it, was, it was a boon for the communities. So my talk is going to focus primarily on three communities along the, uh, the canal here in Hopewell Valley, uh, Washington Crossing, Titusville right here, and uh, a little hamlet called Moore. So Washington Crossing uh, was established in the middle of the 18th century. It was originally known as Johnson's Ferry or Eight Mile Ferry in reference to its distance from Trenton. A vital route of commerce between Hopewell Valley and Newtown. At the time, the seat of Bucks County until 1813, the ferry also established a viable means of commerce to the Philadelphia markets. It was the first of many ferries to be established along the Delaware River. The earliest road connection to the ferry uh, was from Old River Road uh, and formally laid out in 1767. Ownership of the ferry passed through a various number of families during the eight, late 18th and early 19th century. The name of each ferry owner closely associated with the identification of the community at that time. Of some significance, the development of the community was Taylor's Lumber Yard, established in 1819. The lumber yard making use of local sources of timber, as well as that which was rafted down the river the Taylor family owned the ferry from 1828 to 1834. During this time period, the community adopted the name Bernardsville in the recognition of Bernard Taylor, the owner of the ferry. When the ferry was owned by the Johnson family, a tavern was also established adjacent to the ferry crossing. Over the years, the tavern prospered and was enlarged to eventually become a sizable hotel. The main portion of the hotel, Nelson's Hotel, as some of you may know it, survived until the mid 1930s. The arrival of the railroad, the station, a station was erected and named Washington Crossing. A short time afterwards, the community adopted this name as its own. Also in conjunction with the construction of the canal, the legislatures of New Jersey and Pennsylvania in 1831 authorized the construction of a bridge to replace this busy ferry. In 1834, the bridge was formally open to traffic and the ferry was discontinued. Although it would make another appearance in 1903 after a major flood destroyed the second bridge at the location. So um, was not able to be uh, readily identify when the new, the current bridge was built. Uh, I think it only took a couple of years. Um, so if anybody has a, any idea what that date is, I'd appreciate that. Our next community is Titusville. Prior to 19, or 1819, the Knowles family, established a general store on what we now know as Church Road. It also established another public road between the store and the ferry to the south, roughly aligned with what we call Route 29 today. In 1831, the Knoll store and associated properties were acquired by Uriel Titus, thereby providing him with the ownership of all riverfront property between Moores Creek and the ravine at the cemetery of this very church. The community is named for the Titus family, which came to the Eastern part of Hopewell Township from Long Island in the early 1700s. 
By the middle of the 19th century, Joseph Titus established a large farmstead north of the village that bears his name. Joseph and his son Uriel established a number of commercial entities that benefited from the abundant natural resources of the area, namely the establishment of a shad fishery, which I believe is named Sand Gully Sand Fisheries, but yet this has to be confirmed. Also, two sawmills were established along the riverbank. The arrival of the canal provided enormous economic opportunities for local residents. Early developments included a coal and a lumber yard and a grain warehouse along the canal. The United States Post Office saw fit to establish a post office here on April 3rd, 1833. Mr. John Hoff serving as our first postmaster. Uriel went on to subdivide his land into building lots. Fortunately, he died in 1834, but his heirs planned to continue developing the community. He left all of his holdings to his son, Joseph. Also was a very enterprising individual. Joseph Titus, in addition to personally underwriting an eighth part of the annual budget of the Titusville Presbyterian Church, he provided the land for the church and the graveyard in 1839. And in 1846, he donated the land on which the parsonage is located. He built a tavern in 1835 for the accommodation of boatmen near Titus Cove. He rented this tavern to John Sargent, to whom he sold, to, sold it to in 1846. Joseph Titus also ran the former Levi Knoll store, operated the log basin, the lumber yard, a sawmill, a gristmill, and he also farmed. His mills were situated along Fiddler's Creek. Despite his efforts, the panic of 1837 stopped all of his real estate endeavors. When Mr. Titus passed away, he bequeathed land to be cre and created an endowment for the first Titusville school to be operated as a parochial school for the Presbyterian Church. He also provided the land and building for Temperance Hall. Very generous individual. Our next community is Moore, a little bit upstream. Okay. When the Belldale came to town, it established a number of stations along the right of way uh, between Trenton and Lambertville. Uh, this little hamlet being one of them, there was uh, an, quite a bit of farming activity in the Pleasant Valley. And they decided that this would be a good place to build a small station to serve that community. And they needed a name. Um, so the, the residents got together and chose a name to recognize a family that had owned large tracts of land in the area for several generations. They named it Moore after Amos Moore, whose family came to Hopewell in the early 18th century with several other early Hopewell settlers from Long Island. Amos owned substantial amounts of land on the south side of Pleasant Valley Road, stretching from the Delaware River inland almost a mile. No real economic center developed at the station, although the county workhouse is situated north of the station, and there was a small quarry just south of it um, that was established around 1892.
So in the station at Moore, there was also a small telegraph station that was used to communicate to other stations along the line to control the traffic uh, up and down the Bell Dell. It was just one of many of these telegraph stations along the line. Uh, let's see here. So a rail spur had been built to the quarry in 1898 and connected with the Baldell just, just north of the station. Quarry also needed stone cutters and attracted large numbers of immigrants. The shanty town grew up along River Road and Pleasant Valley across from the station. In 1900, the 68 immigrants making the, up the shanty town were all males. Many married but without their families, ranging in age from the 20s to their 50s. Some had immigrated to the United States as much as 18 years earlier, but most had arrived within the past five years. In the early, in the, pardon me, in the, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, many of the farmers in the area started to raise dairy cattle. And to accommodate this, the, the railroad built a small platform at Moore so this, this milk could be shipped to Trenton, Philadelphia. We'll talk more about more in a short period. So here's Titusville in 1849. We see some development here between the arrival of the canal and this particular time frame. So there are about 17 structures in Titusville at this particular point. Most of them occupying the area from Fiddler's Creek to the church here. In the map, we have a hotel, a wheelwright shop, a store, post office, the church itself and the school. There's also a cooperage here in town, a lumber yard, the grist mill, a sawmill, and the log basin. In March of 1836, the Belvedere Delaware Railroad was incorporated to build a railroad between Trenton North to Belvedere on the Delaware River, connecting the railroad project, uh, connecting with the railroad projected to the Susquehanna Valley in Pennsylvania. Survey had been performed in 1837 by Edwin Douglas. He provides his report to the board of directors. However, the depression of 1837 negatively impacted any interest in purchasing shares of the Bell Dell. In 1838, October of 1838, pardon me, the Bell Dell holds its last meeting until July of 1848. Oops. Sorry about that. As a result of the depression of the 1837, a supplement to the charter was made that authorized the Camden Amboy to subscribe to the Belvedere Delaware Railroad. This was an effort to increase funding for construction of the railroad. But what it also did was resulted in the control of the Belvedere Railroad by the Camden and Amboy. This also provided an extension of the Camden and Amboy's monopoly on railroad operations between New York and Philadelphia. So things were pretty dormant for a number of years. Uh, the railroad had about 10 years to construct 
uh, the line between the two endpoints or its charter would have become void. Uh, there were a couple of extensions to that and the charter had been amended so that if the Valdell completed the railroad between Trenton and Lambertville, it would satisfy the charter. But still, despite the fact that the Camden and Amboy bought $500,000 worth of stock, there was still resistance for other investors to purchase the stock required to finance the construction of the railroad. So in many ways, the construction of the railroad was in jeopardy at this particular point. Had it not been for this gentleman, Peter Cooper. Peter Cooper was a very enterprising individual. He was looking for a new ironwork site in the 1840s. And was having a difficult time finding one. He was already pretty famous for his, in, his accomplishments as a, a, an inventor. He started out his career after schooling of one year as a coachmaker's apprentice. But his mechanical ability led him to other things. He manufactured cloth shearing machines. And with the profits from that endeavor, he bought a clue factory in Baltimore and developed the best glue in the market. He wanted to continue his endeavors in Baltimore with the b and Railroad, but could not do that because there wasn't enough that the cost for shipping his iron to his foundries was exorbitant from Baltimore. He needed to find a place that was closer to his factory. So after looking around in 1845, he bought a site on the Delaware River in Trenton. So he planned to put his new ironworks there. He put his 21 year old son in charge of that. And his son convinced him to partner with his friend, Abraham, Abram Hewitt. So the two of them came together and started this foundry, which was actually very successful. But Peter had another problem. He had to get his iron that was being mined in North, Northern New Jersey to the factory quicker so that he can increase his production. Canal boats were too slow. So Peter endorsed the building of the Belladale Railroad. And that's what actually caused a lot of other investors since they saw how profitable his iron business was in Trenton and what it could do. More people invested in the railroad. Now it should be said that this gentleman, Robert Stevens is of interest also. Mr. Stevens was intricately involved with the Camden and Amboy Railroad, very in influential person. In 1846, he decided to order 200 tons of rails from Peter Cooper's foundry in Trenton, rather than spending the money shipping it from England. This was another impetus for other investors to purchase stock in the Bell Dell. So Mr. Stevens has a long history uh, with the development of railroads here in the early years. One of his claims to fame here is the development of 
the T-rail that we know today. This is a rolled piece of iron that's used, the shape is fairly common to what's used at this point. Prior to this, uh, the form of the rail was in a number of different shapes, none of it all that good. This was a very innovative uh, development in, in railroads, and it was one of the reasons that caused the railroad industry to take off here in the United States. The shape was adopted by virtually every railroad across the world in very, very short order. So at this point in the late 40s, 1840s, more people subscribed to the shares of the Beldell. And then it came to an Amboy authorized a survey of the railroad to be done. In July of 1848, they conducted their first meeting since 1838. A gentleman by the name of Ashbell Welch reports on the survey for the Belldale Railroad in 1849. This being done, construction started in the spring of 1851 in Trenton and progressed north to Lambertville. Fortunately, in September of 1850, a great storm came by and washed out many of the bridges and much of the roadbed south of Lambertville. However, repairs being made, construction crews reported to have completed the route to Lambertville by February of 1851. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order here. So in 1847, Mr. Cooper purchased land to build a copper, or pardon me, a furnace at Phillipsburg to process his iron ore. This expedited his, his, or this increased his need for supply of iron for his forge in Trenton. At the time it was completed, it was one of the largest, it was the largest blast furnace in the country at the time. So here's Mr. Cooper's ironworks in Trenton. It originally had been located on the banks of the Delaware. That building still survives today. Um, I'm not sure what they're calling it these days. Cooper's at Riverview or something of that nature. But Mr. Cooper bought a, a, a wire company in what uh, would be considered right now the intersection of Route 129 and Hamilton Avenue, uh, where the arena is in Trenton now, is where the site of those iron works had been. This location provided easy access to the iron ore that was forged in Phillipsburg and to coal, because it was also situated on the canal and the railroad there in Trenton. This gentleman here was very instrumental in the building of the Belldale Railroad. This is Mr. Ashbell Welch. He lived in Lambertville. He was a canal and railroad builder, a corporate manager, an industrial designer, an inventor, a marine architect, and had an incredible career as a most proficient and innovative engineer. Had done work in the construction of the, can, uh, the Delaware and Raritan Canal, which he supervised its construction, and then was appointed the position of chief engineer in 1835 of the, what was called the Joint Companies, the union between the Delaware and Raritan Canal and the Camden Amboy Railroad. He held this position for the next 36 years. 
He was also appointed chief engineer of the Philadelphia and Trenton Railroad. When he was involved with building the Bell Dell in 1852 and 1853, he was also involved in lengthening the Delaware and Raritan locks at the main canal, which he had done in 111 days. The following winter, he was in charge of the same work being done at, on the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. He was instrumental in early railroad safety devices placing into operation on the Camden and Amboy and the Philadelphia and Trenton in 1863, a system of blocks to space trains apart from one another. In 1868, he designed and supervised the installation of steam powered winches and steam activated valves and gates for all locks on the main Delaware American Canal to greatly speed the passage of vessels through the locks. He designed them and built them uh, an efficient freight terminal in Harsimus Cove in Jersey City. So he was a well-regarded engineer and known amongst the railroad community. He had been elected president of the American Society for Civil Engineers. It was a Lambertville resident and leader for 50 years. Mr. Welsh passed away in 1882 uh, in his home on York Street in Lambertville. As a result, the railroad ran special funeral trains from both Phillipsburg and Trenton to Lambertville, where more than 4,000 people attended the Presbyterian Church service for Mr. Welsh. He has laid the rest above the town of Lambertville in the Mount Hope Cemetery. He was a very religious man. Mr. Welsh insisted that the railroad not be operated on Sundays, not only because he wanted no accidents or mishap to occur on the Lord's day, but because a day of rest would result in more efficient and alert employees. There were no Sunday trains scheduled for the first 46 years of operation on the Bell of Dell. It was dubbed locally as the Sabbatarian Railroad. <laughs> Now, simultaneously with the construction of the Bell Dell, the feeder canal was also widened and deepened to accommodate the largest barges available of Lehigh Valley Coal. The coal would come down on the Delaware Canal on the Pennsylvania side of the river, and then it would be transferred over at New Hope into Lambertville, where a new lock was built. And this greatly increased the amount of barge traffic on the feeder canal after 1851. To give you some idea of where all this traffic on the canal and the Bell Gal came from, we have this map here. Unfortunately, it's not big enough for everyone here to see. Here's Trenton. It's Phillipsburg, Belldale Ran, part of this Philadelphia, Trenton, Phillipsburg the Canal is coming down from northeastern Pennsylvania for markets in New York and Philadelphia. Now, there was another canal, you may know, the Morris Canal that ran across the northern portion of New Jersey. The Delaware and Raritan Canal had the advantage, though, although the route was longer. There were fewer rocks and it made it easier access and quicker transport for coal to come to New York. In January of 1856, first coal trains came down from the Sugarloaf Mines above Ma Trunk on the Lehigh Valley Railroad to Trenton via the Beldale Railroad using the lower level of Easton Bridge. In April of 1856, Coalport Basin opens up on the east side of Trenton for the purpose of loading anthracite coal brought down from the Bell Dow into canal boats to continue their trip up to Perth Amboy and on to New York. In 18, on June 2nd, 1856, the Lehigh Valley Railroad 
pull trains from Ma Chunk to Trenton down to Bell to Bell Del Railroad, 100 cars with 550 tons of coal, or total, pardon me, a total weight of eight, 550 tons of coal, about the same as all the coal trains on the Reading would move in one day. They accommodated in one train. My slides are sorted. I apologize for that. I do, huh? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Even so, uh, they're a little, they're, I apologize, they're a little bit out of order. Uh, so here's an in, a typical interior of a, of a car uh, around the 1850s, 1860s. Um, a little unruly, I think you'd expect. That I think there were a number of problems uh, with the travelers uh, and the crowds that, that started uh, taking the train from Lambertville uh, and all over. Uh, so much so that uh, the railroad adopted in the early 1870s a new set of rules that ended up being quite popular with the travelers. Conductors were required at that point to see that all passengers had seats, to expel all drunken and disorderly persons from cars, not to allow any profane language. No tickets will be sold to intoxicated persons or those incapable of taking care of themselves. Baggage masters were required to handle articles carefully and news agents were no longer allowed to force their papers and books on passengers nor were they permitted to place papers, candies, things of that nature in the laps of passengers. Okay. So from the beginning of service, the Belldale officials were very conscious of marketing opportunities of the Delaware Valley and the upper Delaware region. The route was heavily promoted to tourists and travelers. As we can see here in this advertisement, the Belle Del offered excursions for the 4th of July to go down from Lambertville to Trenton. And you can see there were a number of them, 25 cents each way. This is in 1851 the first year the railroad was in operation. This was the first of a long tradition of the Belle Del offering excursions along its line. Promotions had been made over the years and by the 1870s, it promoted its services to Delaware Valley line and publicized it as the favorite summer route. Marketing stressed that the water gap could be reached within a few hours of Philadelphia. Indeed, timetables offered a three day round trip excursion ticket from Philadelphia to the water gap for the sum of $4.50. This ticket was also valid for a passenger who was interested in a quick one day trip. In such a case, the traveler departing Philadelphia on the 7 a.m. train could enjoy six hours and 45 minutes at the water gap before returning to the Quaker City. Over the years, there have been a number of special trains uh, on the Baldell. Um, these include trains used to transport ice to Philadelphia and Trenton and New York. Peach trains were very common uh, in the 18, 60s all the way up to the 1890s, mid 1890s, milk trains, circus trains, agricultural ex exhibition trains, agricultural instruction trains, presidential specials, sports specials, conscription trains, and special trains for strawberries. Peaches had been a significant crop in Mercer and Hunterdon counties in the mid 1800s. 
uh, so much so that the Valdez every year ran extra trains from 1850s all the way to 1895 uh, to transport these this cargo to Philadelphia and to New York. Unfortunately, in 1895, also marked the arrival of a disease, San Jose scale, which completely wiped out the peach industry in the Mercer and Hunterdon County areas, all of Northern New Jersey. In 1854, the Daily State Gazette out of Trenton contained an announcement that passenger car will be attached to a freight train, leaving Warren Street at six o'clock in the morning and stopping for passenger at, at Ewing, Washington's Crossing, Titusville, and Moores to accommodate people who wish to make the early stages from Lambertville to the agricultural fair in Doylestown. By 1855, the Bell advertised two trains each way daily between Phillipsburg and Philadelphia. A through car was attached to the rear of the train and travel was about four and a half hours. Fare was about $1.50. The railroads also carried mail amongst the communities uh, and did so until the end of passenger service in 1853. So here we have another image of Titusville in 1860. The village by that point had grown to 31 structures, only listing two hotels now, a series of mercantile and commercial establishment to serve the local farmers, the railroad and boatmen. Titusville Hotel was three stories at this particular point in time. It's the, the biggest structure in town. Continued to do to be so, I would think, until it was torn down. When the Delaware arrived here in 1851, a large grain warehouse was constructed next to the tracks at Church Street. Passenger freight station was also built opposite of Church Street. On the eastern banks of the canal stood the Agnew and Snook Mills, a harness shop, a blacksmith, a carpenter shop, and several residents south of Church Street. And we also had a bridge tender's house at the north end of the village. By the 1860s, the average annual revenue for passengers on the Bell Dell was $125,000. And for the mail and express, it averaged about $53,000. In August of 1860, newspaper announced that a coach would be added to the rear of the down coal train departing Lambertville at 1.55 p.m. And another coach was added to the rear for the up freight train departing from Warren Street at 11 a.m. to accommodate those people who wish to attend the large harvest house in Titusville. I could not find anything else about this particular event. So if anybody has any knowledge of it, I think we would be interested of. In 1863, construction of a telegraph line along the Bell Dell had been, had, was begun. And in 1865, the Bell Dell organized a route to the Falls of Niagara from Philadelphia through the Delaware Valley and the Delaware Water Gap Scranton, Great Bend, Central New York, the Great Lakes, and canals. Here's an image for an advertisement for the circus. This one is in the, uh, the 20th century, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, and, and shows even at this late date that the railroad had been used for the conveyance of circuses which had been popular along the line uh, since its inception. In 
1853, not long after the Belle Dell reached Milford, two sections of the Her Thiesbach Company Menagerie and the Rivers Darius and Company Circus visited Milford while another section went and visited Lambertville. Through the decade of the 1850s, the following circus groups included Welch's Grand National Circus, Spalding and Rogers Railroad Circus, Dan Rice's Circus, Levi J. North Circus, Myers and Madigan's Circus, and Joe Pentland's cir Circus. So many of them. Try to get an image of the earlier equipment on the Bell Dow. I came up with two fairly decent images. This one is from the 1860s and doesn't look like it's from around here, does it? This is actually the Camden and Amboy in Princeton. And while I wish we could make it out on this particular screen, the box car that you see there and the passenger car are Bell Dell equipment as a result of the close relationship of the Camden and Amboy and the, and the Bell Dell. I am running out of time, aren't I? I need to speed this up, folks. So I'm going to pass through some of this. Here in 18, this is probably, this is the last, last timetable that was issued by the Bell Dow before it was taken over by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, but it touted its service to these far off summer resort places. They're all listed there. Many of them are the ones that I had just listed to you earlier. The 1870s were pretty busy for the railroad. Traffic increased significantly. And it was also a time when the Mercer and Somerset opened. Now, I don't have a schedule here. Let me see. Actually, I do. This one's kind of similar to the one that we have on display over here. This is the first timetable issued by the Pennsylvania Railroad after it took over the Bell Dow operations. And as you can see, there, there's a good number of trains going up and down the line. At the bottom, we have the Mercer and Somerset Railroad trains that left at Somerset Junction, which is at the border of Hopewell Township and Ewing Township on Jacobs Creek Road. Prior to this point, there were only two trains in operation uh, each way. Now, there are four. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1879, the conscription train that we spoke of, um, uh, pardon me, uh, it, the conscription trains were operated during the, uh, the Civil War. But in 1879, the Bell Dell had a prison car it had operated between Warren County Courthouse and Belvedere and the state prison in Trenton. Friends and relatives of convicted men were allowed to ride along with the prisoners in the same car by purchasing a ticket. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Here's an image of Titusville uh, around 1875. I had traded this a, a while ago, found an interesting document that listed uh, a directory with what uh, many of the occupations that were, were provided here in town. So things are pretty sizable at this particular point. <laughs> 1875. So along with some of the other trains that the, uh, the railroad ran, they went to the fairs. They went to Flemington starting in 1855. They went to the Belvedere Fair starting in 1858. In 1887, the railroad started running extra trains for the interstate fair at Trenton. These trains would go directly to the fairgrounds. Passengers did not have to get off, change trains. 
once they arrived at Trenton. In 1890, 14 trains left Warren Street for the, for the interstate fair. In 1891, special trains from Flemington also transported fairgoers to Trenton. In Hopewell, children were given a day off to go to the fair. And uh, Beldell brought many families in Hopewell Valley all the way to the fairgrounds. Other special events, we saw many presidential candidates come along to Beldell. Rutherford B. Hayes was one of them traveled in 1880, going to Phillipsburg to participate in the dedication of the rebuilt party hall in Lafayette College. Another interesting note, in 1884, the Bible Society stopped placing Bibles on the Bell Dell passenger cars because too many of them were mutilated or stolen. Also in 1884, a record 21 loaded coal trains passed down to Beldell in one day. In 1885, President Grover Cleveland passed through on his way to Buffalo, New York. I'll speak just a little bit about the Titusville Fruit and Vegetable Canning Company. I guess most of you are familiar with this. This uh, image is courtesy of Mr. Kidder, who did a talk and wrote a short paper on the company a couple of years ago, and I'm indebted to him for allowing me to use this image. So in 1889, the canning company was incorporated and seasonally, empl seasonally employed 50 people to produce its Delaware Valley brand and did so until 1912. So the canning company was located at the north end of the village and did fairly well, um, but only lasted for approximately 23 years. Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the variability of, of the crop that and quality of the crop that had been offered. They canned mostly tomatoes, but it also did pumpkins. And there's some report of them jarring raspberries, as far as I can tell. But getting produce, quality produce ended up being a problem. And the other actually problem was and the railroad had a lot to do with this. Farmers could get a better price for their product in Trent. <laughs> so later the building, which still survives um, as a, I think a family home, uh, the building was the home of Otto Niederer and Sons, who manufactured the first successful automatic egg grading machine, the Egomatic. I think everyone's familiar with that, right? I had to, I had to tell you about that. <laughs> the railroad was really instrumental in in helping popularize baseball, and this is a topic I really wish I could have time to go through in a little bit more depth, but I fear that I'm not. But the railroad with its branch to Flemington, and I guess to some point when the Mercer and Somerset was, was running, allowed competition between teams in the local towns, Flemington, Trenton, Hopewell, Pennington, Ringo's. Even there was a, a team up in Pleasant Valley, I understand. They were adult teams. 
as a matter of fact, correct me if I'm wrong. I think at the Howell Living History Forum, they do an exhibition at least once every summer of the, you know, the original rules of baseball, no gloves, right? So the 1890s traffic continued uh, to grow on the Belle Dell. It was a very profitable railroad. They started moving ice from Northern New Jersey and Pennsylvania then to Philadelphia. They were offering greater service. Oops, why do I keep doing that? I'm sorry. Greater service to uh, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, things of that nature. Um, all in all, uh, a very busy and profitable railroad. Uh, excursions to all sorts of places, even locally. Atlantic City in 1897, $2.25. Other notable trains passing through, there's the Liberty Bell. Liberty Bell passed up to the Bell Dell, not once, but twice. The first time was in 1904, when it was en route to the St. Louis World's Fair commemorating the 1803 per Louisiana Purchase. Made a second visit on Thanksgiving Day in 1915. It was being returned to Philadelphia following the San Francisco Pan American Exposition. As the train passed through Lambertville at 1.30 in the afternoon, school, skilled, school children sang patriotic songs while a squad of militia fired salutes over the train. In the early 1900s, one-day excursions are operated on the Bell Dell to locations like Asbury Park, Long Branch, and Ocean Grove. It's during this period of time we see ex-president Grover Cleveland passing through Lambertville. Quite a number of people have gathered at the station to see that the distinguishedly person distinguished personality. He spent several days fishing the Delaware near Frenchtown. Also in the early 1900s, stations along the Belle Dell were visited by a flower car, which left plants to fill out the grounds in a fine style. Strawberries started to pass over the Belle Dell in a direction that you wouldn't expect. They went north. Apparently, the market in Boston paid more. There was a special train, 40 carloads in 18, uh, 1904, that took the local crop up to Boston. So this is a photograph of William Jennings Bryant, the Democratic nominee for office uh, of President of the United States. He delivered speeches here from a special observation car along the Bell Dow. Stops have been made in 1908 at Warren Street, Lambertville, and other towns adjacent to the Peter Canal. I couldn't ascertain whether he stopped here in Titusville, unfortunately. Another image of a train in the early 1900s on the Bell Dow. 1912. President William Howard Taft went north on the Bell Dell on a special campaign train. He made enthusiastic speeches from the rear car at Lambertville and at other towns himself. Also in 1912, Teddy Roosevelt traveled south along the, the feeder canal, making several stops, Lambertville and Trenton, where he also spoke to large crowds. So the Bell Dell was a means for candidates to communicate to the constituents of potential voters. Very, very popular in the day. In 1913, a Sunday excursion on the Bell Dell. So popular, it required 34 cars in three sections to carry 2,000 passengers to Washington, D.C. In 1914, an agricultural exhibition train co-sponsored by the Pennsylvania Railroad and the state of New Jersey came up to Bell Dell and vi visited Phillipsburg, providing instructions to local farmers.
I had to bring this one to your attention. Um, for about 20 years, uh, in the early 1900s, Beldell offered uh, a special train early on New Year's Day to bring people down to Philadelphia to take part in the Mummer's Day Parade. Fare was $1.25 from Lambertville and $1.75 from Phillipsburg. The war impacted the Beldell also. During World War I, the railroad placed guards on or near all bridges to protect them from German sympathizers in the US. Here we see the first inductee special operated over the Beldell to Fort Dix, 84 people boarding at Phillipsburg and another 104 from the Delaware Lackawanna connection at Lehigh Junction Station. It was also during this period of time that a number of construction trains operated on the Bell Dell, bringing inductees down to Fort Dix. Here's a photo of Titusville in the 1820s. At this particular time frame, the community became very popular as a summer resort and a number of cottages had been built uh, in the town between here and towards Washington Crossing. Um, and if I recall correctly, lots were of decent size, 50 by maybe 100, 50 by 150 feet offered for $200 and above. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so in, in the 1920s, uh, the Public Utility Commission allowed the railroad to remove several of its trains uh, between Trenton, Phillipsburg and Strasburg. The heyday of the railroad travel was on the decline. The 1920s also marked another significant development in the area which was the construction of Route 29. This had a negative impact, not only on passengers on the Beldell, but also on freight. Anybody familiar with this photograph? Yeah. I think most people are, right? My grandmother's in there. Yes. Would you mind coming up and showing everybody? <laughs> Yeah, and she's there, right behind the church. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I couldn't resist. I wasn't going to put any of these photos to talk about some of the wrecks that were on the railroad, but in this case, I couldn't resist to show this to everybody if they hadn't seen that. Amazingly, it was only the locomotive that had derailed and went into the canal. Um, and as fortune would have it, there was a, a luncheon going on here at the church, and Everybody went out to help uh, and feed the, the folks that had uh, been involved in this unfortunate accident. It could have been a strawberry festival. They have been here a lot. I'm, I think this was a, re it was a regular, it was a regularly scheduled train. And I know that. I'm not sure if it's the train that went up to Buffalo or not. The dinner at the church. Yeah, it was strawberry festival. Oh, at the church. I, you know what? I, th I think I had heard about that. It went to the canal. Yeah, off into the canal. It wasn't the first time. It wasn't the last time either. <laughs> so in the, uh, the 1920s and 30s, we saw some decline in passenger service and also in freight service. But there were still other things that went on um, that were kind of interesting. Apparently, in the, in the 20s and 30s, there were some peacetime military training exercises down towards Washington Crossing that were public demonstrations. And from what I understand, some of these had been filmed, brought down to Trent and shown in theaters in the afternoon. 
1935, preparations for, for the Army's first maneuvers uh, since World War I were taken, transporting 19 special trains of officers and men to camps in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, it was also in the 18, pardon me, 1930s that the canal officially closed for commercial traffic. In 1842, one round trip uh, on the Beldel was eliminated because equipment was needed for wartime troop movements. I'm not sure these, these trains actually ever return. 1944, Franklin Delano Roosevelt traveled on the Bell Dell on Labor Day weekend to Hyde Park um, over the, uh, the Bell Dell, which was an unusual route for him to take. In 1947, passenger service from Stroudsburg to Trenton, a Sunday only train was discontinued. So in 1848, the last circus trains on the Bell Dow, two sections of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey train, ended up tra traveling up the Delaware River route from Washington to Boston. This was the last movement of circus train on the railroad. What year was that? 18, pardon me, 1948. Really? Really? Okay, well that I'll have to look that up. This is from Mr. Lee in his book, actually. So I guess we're all subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in uh, 1949, the railroad petitioned the Public Utilities Commission to discontinue all railroad service on the Bell Dow. Wasn't allowed to do that. Refused. But the railroad did replace the steam power trains with the doodle bug. We'll have a picture of one of those in a little bit, right here. And although I couldn't make out the number of this car, so I don't know if it was the last one that operated uh, in what we'll call regular passenger service. This is a photograph here on the Bell Dow, uh, a rail fan special. That is single. Yes, it's a single, it's a gas electric uh, motor car. I, re I remember that. And I also remember in the very late 40s, early 50s, that they, they had a second car. Uh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen images of that also. Um, but in 1953, the railroad did stop sending mail uh, on its route. That was the end, November 30th in, in 1953, all what they call railway post office operations stopped here on the Bell Dell. By 1956, the railroad had one train left on the Bell Dell, a round trip between Trent and Phillipsburg. The railroad justified that the average of only 17 people were on the train each day, and only one was making the hour and a half, 50 mile trip between Phillipsburg and Trenton. But yet again, New Jersey Public Utilities Commission rejected the bid to remove the trains. I guess the PR pleaded its case a little bit more strongly in 18, or 1960. The last train operated um, ending 109 years of passenger service to Lambertville and 106 years of passenger service to Phillipsburg. A couple of quick photographs of some freight train operations of, of recent vintage, relatively recent vintage. This would be the 19. 60s. And another 
one final train to tell you folks about. Although the Belldale was abandoned in 1976, sufficient amount of trackage was left in operable condition and a Cadwalder Park to accommodate the American Freedom Train. It was in, that was here, I think it was late August or early September of that year. I'll go through this rather quickly because I'm taking up far too much time here. But Black River and Western Railroad purchased a portion of the, the Bell Dell, particularly the Flemington branch from Lambertville up to Flemington and in a short segment up to almost stopped into the quarry there and operated that for a good number of years. Service to Lambertville stopped in early 2000s, I think it was. I'm not sure of the exact date. Uh, and service had been truncated from Ringo's all the way up to Flemington. I understand they're trying to get back to Lambertville, but I don't know what I that looks like. Two years ago. Did they? Yes. And then uh, when did we have the, the, the hurricane that came mm -hmm. through and just recently with a, a 10 inches of rain? Right. It actually washed the uh, track out. I did not know that. So there's a steam operation up uh, in Phillipsburg that runs excursions down to, I think they're getting all the way down to Carpentersville now. Uh, ah, okay. What more can I say? They're the experts. Ah, okay. Thanks for coming. So I, I encourage folks to go up there, check that out. Fun time. I've done it a couple of times. Millie, does anybody know about Millie? Did, did you guys did you guys restore that? Was that were you folks? Okay. That's now. Was it from the paper plant? The the switcher. It was from the Gilbert Electric Station. Okay. Uh, it hold uh, coal cars. Mm -hmm. That's where it spent its whole life. Um, a gentleman named Don Sardro, um out of its deathbed in there, cut down a lot of trees, pulled it out. Uh, took him several years to completely restore it. And it still remains on the Bell Dell and Post Park this day. Okay. So uh, I think the last time I heard of it running into for the Milford Alive. Milford was, Alive. Yeah. Do they, are they still doing that, running it every year? Yeah, COVID 19 kind of killed that. That's what I had thought. Yeah. Um, but we have certified, FRA certified two miles out of Milford Monk. Okay. Yeah, so we're. Uh, trying to keep it alive. Good. Good. That's glad. I'm glad to hear that. And then I think this might be my last slide. Close to it. We'll see. Regalsville. So this started a couple of years ago with some grants. Uh, some of the, the, the local, what, historical society, I believe it was. Uh, they they were part of that uh, up in Warren County here, and on the right hand or left hand side there is the original Regalsville station. It was consumed by a fire in eighteen, pardon me, nineteen sixty nine. Um, but the community said we'd like to have it back, so they're rebuilding, they're recreating the uh, the entire station. What an endeavor. Yeah, a oh. lot of grants, a lot of effort. There's still a lot of effort going on. Uh, you'll find it on our website, the New York Assessment for Hand of Delaware River Railroad Excursions. Uh -huh. uh, it's nearing completion. We're hoping the tracks all be restored down to uh, down to Riddlesville, okay. New Jersey. Yep. And uh, we're hoping to start resuming this spring uh, for the first time coming down to Riddlesville. That's exciting. Yes, yes. It's very exciting. Wow. Well, I implore everybody to keep tabs on that, see how that develops.
Pat. I'm done. Pat.